Hello, Pure Heart Church family. Thank you so much for being here with us today. If you are new and it's your first time here, from our heart to yours, welcome. You are gathering around a family of people who believe it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to pretend and it's not okay to stay stuck. We believe we have all the right opportunities available to you and your family as you stick around, get connected, and grow in this journey. If you are a member or a regular attendee of PeerHeart, make sure you have the PeerHeart app downloaded on your smartphone so you can watch previous sermons or check out our Becoming Like Jesus podcast. On the app, you can also sign up for upcoming events, find opportunities to serve, and access mobile giving. Your faithful giving is a part of communities and lives continuing to be reached for Christ. Last week, we shared about ministering to children on the Navajo Reservation by building and delivering bunk beds. But the challenges don't stop there. Families on the Navajo Reservation also face food scarcity. Some of the most requested items by our Navajo partners are bulk food items like beans, rice, potatoes, and clean water. Fresh foods are extremely hard to come by where they are located. So our LifeBridge Resource Center team of staff and volunteers packed up 40,000 pounds of non-perishable food and water. Salad & Go partnered with us as well to bring six of their employees to make fresh salads for this community. As we organized the distribution, we already had cars lined up the highway waiting to receive these vital resources. And while the drive through progressed, other members of our team directly delivered supplies to families who were lacking the resources to travel to the distribution site. For several hours, we got the opportunity to bless family after family with needed food, water, and medical supplies. We served 1,649 people, including 1,500 fresh salads. In all, this trip helped meet the immediate needs of 625 households. What an amazing opportunity that God let us be a part of. Can you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for being the God who provides. We thank you so much for being the God of generosity. We thank you, God, that you have given Pure Heart the opportunity to reach a community in great need, God, and provide exactly what they need for them and their families. You are so good to us, and you are so loving, and you are so kind, God. We just honor you here with everything that we got to be a part of over the last couple weeks. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. I got to go up to that reservation, and the look on some of those people's faces was truly impacting my heart and soul. Because you see, when you meet people's physical and tangible needs, they then truly feel the love of Christ in their life. You know, we here in the United States, we have the holiday of Thanksgiving coming up. And one of the things that we do every single year here at Pure Heart is we gather together Thanksgiving food boxes. And that's where you put together a turkey and some stuffing and cranberry sauce and all those things that you need to have a Thanksgiving dinner and put them together in a box. And we usually drop them off at the church. And so if you live near the church here in the Glendale, Phoenix area, we would love you to put together one of those and drop it off the church. But if you live someplace else in the world, here's what we want you to do is this Thanksgiving, put together a food box. If you scroll down on our website, pureart.org, and you see the little turkey at the bottom, click that. It has a list of the things that you can put together in that food box. And here's what you're gonna do. It's either contact food bank near you, contact church near you, or even better this, find a family near you to drop that off. Impact their life. See the look in their eyes when you go up and hand it to them and say, we just want to bless you and love you. We want to share Christ's love with you this Thanksgiving. That will change your heart. That'll change your life. We can say we love people, but when we truly are impacting their physical needs, suddenly that speaks volumes in their life. So let's do that this Thanksgiving. I do know one thing also about Thanksgiving, and that is sometimes we have a lack of self-control. Have you ever struggled with self-control? Because if you haven't, that's amazing. And I wanna meet you because I've never met anyone anywhere in my life that says they don't struggle with any area that's self-control, every area of their life they don't. Especially in the world we live in today with such instant gratification promoted all around us. So I think that as we wrap up this series called Evidence, and we've been talking about the fruit of the spirit, this is gonna be one of those messages that is so applicable to all our lives. And Pastor John's going to unpack about how all of us can walk in self-control when God is in our lives, but also when we know 
that we're never alone. There's gonna be a chance to reflect at the end of the service today, and no matter where you're at, if you're watching at home, listening in your car, or if you have this on at work, see, God has a reason for you to listen today. It's not by chance. So stick around, take that opportunity to reflect and, and just process on what God wants to show you for your life about self-control. And so as we wrap up this series, let's get stronger together, grow in our relationship with God together. Let's lean in, see how he wants to show us about self-control today. Welcome to church.
Everyone, thanks so much for joining us this weekend. Uh, everybody that's watching online through Crossroads Recovery, we love you guys. We're so honored to have you joining with us and pray that this message just touches your heart. Everybody that's watching from around the state of Arizona, across the country, around the world, thanks so much for joining us this weekend. That video that you just saw was, was fantastic. It was actually uh, a replica of a Stanford University study that went all the way back to like 1970. And what they did in this original study is they took a single marshmallow, put it on a plate, and then one by one, they would bring these four to five-year-old kids into the room. And so they would tell these children very simply, hey, you can eat this one marshmallow now, or you can wait 10 minutes, not eat this one, and then when it's all done, you get two marshmallows. Now, this, this has been done and it's been replicated numerous times over the past four decades. And what it's really looking at is this idea of delayed gratification. So what the study sought to do was determine if these kids, these preschool kids had enough self-control to put something off that they really wanted right now to have something greater at a later time. What's interesting is that a few years ago, they did a new study based on a similar concept, and this study suggested that kids could actually delay gratification longer and exercise more self-control if they were working together with a partner toward a common goal. So in this newer study, the researchers replicated uh, this, this marshmallow test but they used cookies this time, which is which is fantastic. And I'm just witnessing this big giant crumble cookie right in front of me right now. But they took two different sets of kids, one from Western industrialized Germany, and then they took kids from rural farming communities in the country of Kenya. And so these kids were introduced to a partner and they were asked to do a task together. And then they were put in separate rooms, each, each by themselves, with this single cookie on their plate. Their partner was in a different room doing exactly the same thing and they were told you can eat this now or you can wait until the time is done, the 10 minutes are done, and then you can receive two cookies. And here's what's fascinating. The results showed that with both the German children and the Kenyan children, who were cooperating together, knowing that their partner was with them, even though not physically with them, with them in another room, they were able to exercise greater self-control than the kids who went at it by themselves. So apparently, working with a partner toward a common goal was more effective than going at it alone. Well, we've been in this series called Evidence over the past nine weeks, and we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And in this final week of the series, we're going to look at the very last fruit that Paul lists in Galatians 5.23. Check this out, where Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Now, let's ask ourselves this question as, as we dive in. 
when the temptations of life are sitting right in front of us like a giant crumble cookie. I mean, things that can bring instant gratification, but we know that they're going to cause long-term harm, long-term damage to our souls, damage to relationships, damage and harm to any facet of our lives. Here's the question, will we partner with the Holy Spirit who will help us to exercise the self-control that we need so that we can move into something greater? Something greater like a deeper connection with our Creator, a stronger marriage, a healthier single life, more fruitful relationships, margin in our finances, or, or, or whatever it might be. I would submit to you today that partnering with the Holy Spirit to bring about this fruit of self-control will position us for a better life and for greater influence as God's people in a world that so desperately needs the life that only Jesus can bring. You see, throughout this series, we've been asking this, this big question, do people see Jesus in me? We're asking ourselves, what evidence is coming from our lives that demonstrates that we are followers of Jesus? Does our lifestyle, our character, our actions, does they demonstrate that we are being indwelt, energized, and led by the Spirit of God? In other words, is our life indicative of the new creation that we are in Christ Jesus? And all of these things that we've looked at throughout this series, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and now the crown jewel, self-control, it all comes because of a partnership with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Spirit that's in us to produce the fruit of His Spirit. Well, as we start looking into self-control, we need to look at what it really means. And really, at its core, self-control comes from an ancient word that means the mastering of your inner passions and desires. Think of it like this. Think of it in light of the goals that you want to reach in your life. Think of it in light of the commission that we have been given. Think of it in light of the task that we've been asked to fulfill as God's children. With self-control, will we refrain from all of the things that might hinder us? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There is nothing easy about self-control. But if you will, just for a minute, would you, would you dream with me? Would you dream with me about where you want God to take you in your life? Where, where do you see God taking you? If you, if, you could, if you had a blank slate and you could map out where you really want God to take you, what kind of influence do you want to have? What kind of impact do you want to have on, on those around you? I sat down this week as I was preparing this message and I started doing this for myself. I started dreaming about the life that I would love to have with God. And, and, and here's what I dream. I dream of a life that is fully lived out in loving union with Jesus. A life where my thoughts are truly his thoughts and my ways are truly his ways. I dream of a life where I live fully toward what God has called me to do, totally apart from the expectations of others, just completely focused on what he wants for my life. I dream of a life that, that can find that his strength is made perfect in, in my own weaknesses and my own struggles and where God the Holy Spirit is truly the driving force of my life. I dream of a life where the love that God has lavished down upon my life and put inside of my heart that it flows out of me and through me to my wife to my children, to my grandchildren, further to the team that I'm so honored to work with here at Pure Heart on a daily basis, the, the staff, the office that, that I'm honored to, to work with every day, the congregation that I'm privileged to serve here at, at Pure Heart, and to our culture at large, I dream of leaving a legacy, making a difference. I dream of a life where my sinful passions and unholy desires are crucified daily and the decisions that I make are based entirely on the wisdom of my creator. 
and not of my own accord. Let me ask you, what do you dream of in your life with God? What gets in the way of your dream? I'll tell you what, what gets in the way of my dream, I do. Me, my self, the self that has to be controlled, the self that has to be mastered. Now, I am a huge football fan, and I, I love my Arizona Cardinals because I'm an Arizona native. I just, I'm, I'm that guy. I love the Arizona teams. But I grew up a Cowboys fan, specifically in the era of Roger Staubach and Tom Landry when he was the coach. And Landry was such a great role model, excellent follower of Jesus. And he made this statement I thought was really in alignment with what we're talking about in this message. He said, my job as a coach is to get men to do what they do not enjoy doing in order to achieve what they had always dreamed of. And then he paused and said, discipline. Now, let's be honest, I, I hate that word, discipline. I mean, I want the crumble cookie now. See, the, the problem with self-control is that it requires discipline. But in a bigger picture of this, where we first have to launch when we're dealing with this area of self-control is that self-control starts by taking a look inside. I'm going to be honest with you. This can turn ugly in a hurry. We're going to look at Romans chapter 7. Look at what Paul writes here. He said, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. See, Paul's saying, I, I can't go at this alone. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I love the message paraphrase of these three verses says this, it says, if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, and I think all of us can relate to that, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me, and it gets the better of me every time. As I read that passage in Romans, you know what comes to my mind? That's me. That's me. I read that, and I am all over this passage, and I bet if we're honest, we're all all over this passage. This is us. This is our story, and, it, and it, it, it's no respecter of our status in life. Regardless of gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or whatever, that is us. The struggle is real. Several years ago, Fritz Ridenauer wrote a book called How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious. It's a great book. This is what he said in that book. He said, what's your problem? Temper? Impatience, misordered sexual desires, being honest, your thought life. Everyone has skeletons and they don't always stay in the closet. You want to do right, but you do wrong. You want to choose obedience, but you choose sin. Sometimes you'd almost swear you were a split personality, a walking civil war. And as the message paraphrase of Romans 7, 18 through 20 so beautifully said, I need help. I can't do this alone. And when we start by taking a look inside of our own lives and we realize the struggle that we have to control the impulses and the desires that we have, we know that we can't do it. We are completely powerless to do it on our own. And according to what the scripture says, willpower alone is not going to get it done. We need help. So we start by taking a look inside. But then we have to realize what's really going on is that the lack of self-control is breaking down our defenses against the enemy. We go to Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. And the proverb tells us that a man without self-control 
is like a city broken into and left without walls. I don't really understand what's being saying here, what's being said here. You have to really take a look at how they built cities in ancient times. In ancient times, they first built a wall before anything else. They would build the walls and then they would populate the city. Then they would build the inside of the city and it would grow and find safety and protection. So here's what's going on. If we find that the enemy of our soul is consistently making inroads into our life, we most likely have a missing wall of self-control. And if that wall is consistently being broken into our, our flesh, our self, it kicks in and that's when we derail and that ends up becoming the narrative of our life. Now, now, now how does this even happen? Here's how it happens. It happens when we take away the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. See, having admitted that that's me, According to Romans 7, we admit that, that that's that struggle that's going on inside of us. Here's what we got to do. We've got to rebuild that wall and dwell in the safety that that wall provides. Just being real with you today that this has been the narrative of my own life more than I care to admit. I think about all the times that I've failed, all the times that I've given into a, a temptation and I've left a wake of destruction behind me that affected the people that I love the most, affected my wife, my children, those that I have been entrusted to lead. Every time that I've failed, it can all be traced back to allowing this wall of self-control to be broken into. The very things that, that I hated and I despised, I've done. And the good that I desired to do was nowhere to be found. Can I encourage you today, ladies and gentlemen, that it is time to rebuild our wall of self-control. But again, we can't do it on our own. The wall of self-control is built when we yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Galatians 5.16 right before Paul gives this wonderful list of the fruit of the Spirit that we've been looking at these past nine weeks. Look at what he says here. But I say then, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, I need to pause for a little bit and talk about this idea of walking because walking in the Spirit, this is not a Sunday stroll through the beautiful Arizona October morning. There's an intentionality that's connected with this idea of walking in the Spirit. It means I am going to intentionally order my life and conduct according to the Spirit of God that is inside of me. And the beauty of it is that with that, we have an emphatic promissory note for our future. It says, if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill, we will not bring into action the passions and desires of our flesh. Allow me to speak this into your life today. Your future is not held hostage by your past. You are not held hostage by your failures. You're not held hostage by your addictive behaviors or your lousy decisions. Your future is held in earnest by the Spirit of God. And the good news is this, you do not have to strive for self-control on your own. Walking in the Spirit, intentionally ordering my life in accordance with the direction that the Spirit who lives in me is wanting for me. Walking in the Spirit produces self-control as evidence that He is leading my life. And this battle that I face, this civil war where the things that I don't want to do, I'm doing, and the, the things that I desperately want to do, I, I, I can't do those things. This battle can be won and we can be victorious because of the Spirit of God who lives inside of us. Walk in the Spirit, He says, and you will not fulfill the desires of your flesh. Why? Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. They, they're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do, to keep you from seeing your dreams fulfilled. If you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. 
the right things that I want to do. This is, this is what I find in my own life. The right things that I want to do, by and large, when I lack self-control in my life, they usually take a back seat. And I think we all realize this is true. I mean, let's get practical for a minute. When, when somebody posts something on social media that's, that's offensive to you or it just kind of rubs you the wrong way, you want to stay clear of that. Everything inside of you is fighting to stay clear of that, but yet you go into retaliatory mode. I, I, had, I had this massive breakthrough this week as, as I was preparing this message. I think, okay, I got to live this before I preach it, right? Somebody in my circle of friends posted something, and let's, let's just say that it was a theological dumpster fire, if I could put it that way. And I sat there at the keyboard, and I'm ready to type my response, and I'm ready to go after this. And then all of a sudden, there's that inner voice of the Spirit saying, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go into retaliatory mode. It's not going to be productive for anybody. Or how about this one? When, when you're shopping, and you see the item that you know you don't need, and you can't afford it, but man, it would really impress somebody that you don't even like. And you so desperately want to keep the credit card in your wallet, but then you go into impulse mode. Or how about this one? When it's late at night, your spouse and kids are asleep, and you feel the urge to click the link and visit the site that you know you shouldn't, Everything inside of you wants to turn off the device. The spirit is speaking to you to do that, but then there's that side of you that wants to go into instant gratification mode. Or when you've been sober for weeks, months, or even years, and then the pain of life just comes crashing down on you. And all you wanna do is reach for the pills, reach for the bottle, reach for the needle. But yet there's something else that's so, desperately wants to help redirect you, but yet there's the part of you that just wants to go in to medicate the pain mode. Why is this? Romans 7, Galatians 5, 17. Flesh versus spirit. As Paul said, nothing good dwells in my flesh, but you know what, ladies and gentlemen, we are not bound by it. All that my flesh can produce is ugly and nasty. As Paul goes on with this passage, he says, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I mean, I mean, Paul's like, this isn't even an exhaustive list. It feels like an exhaustive list, but fill in your own struggles there as well. Paul said, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, meaning you will never enjoy the fullness that God has for you with life in his kingdom if you continually give in to the desires of your flesh. That's us. But thank God it doesn't end there because the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells inside of you is crying out, no, 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 there is a better way. You don't have to type the response. You don't have to spend the money. You don't have to click the link. You don't have to take the drink. Here it is. This is what we've been drilling into for nine weeks now as he rounds out this beautiful passage, this beautiful, wonderful promise for us. But the fruit of the Spirit. Think about that. You got all these works of the flesh, and then he says, hey, there's a better way. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And here's our, our word for today, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. See, with the Spirit is in operation in our life, he dominates our flesh. And I gotta tell you, and you need to get this in, into your life today, your flesh is no match for the Spirit of God. You think for a minute that your flesh can, can, can overtake that just, just on its own? No, the power of God is so much greater. That's why the scripture tells us that greater is he who is within us than he who is in the, in the world. You have the power and the capacity to overcome, to exercise self-control, to, to say no to the marshmallow, to say no to the crumble cookie now so that you can enjoy 
God's best life for you down the road. Self-control. See, the works of the flesh are plural, many. Indicates striving, toiling, laboring, sweating versus fruit that is singular, speaking of wholeness and unity of life, but it's born out of choosing to order our life around the Holy Spirit. And I ask you today, which one is better? A life that we can't get past the constant struggle of that's me, a life that is full of broken down walls that afford no protection against the constant bombardment of the enemy who seeks to draw us away from loving union with Jesus? Or is this better? A life that is ordered and directed by God, the Holy Spirit who lives in us. See, ladies and gentlemen, walking in the Spirit is not a passive activity. One of the many things that I love about the Apostle Paul is if you read his writings closely, he, like me, was a huge sports fan. He loved the Greek games. And many times in his writings throughout the New Testament, he uses sports analogies. And I love this one that he uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Check this out. He said, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises, watch this, every athlete exercises self-control. There's our word. Self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. This race that we are running Ladies and gentlemen, we need to run this race with a winning mentality. I'm a guy that hates to lose. I don't like to lose my keys. I don't like to lose my wallet. I don't like to lose at checkers. I just don't like to lose. And yeah, I, I'm that dad who doesn't like to let their kids win. I'm just, I'm just kind of like that. I'm wired that way. But we need to run as though we're going to win. As though we're going to win and obtain the prize. That's exactly what Paul's saying to us here. But he's saying, look, everybody who runs in the natural, they run for a prize that's perishable. In those days, it was an ivy wreath that would wither and fade. But for us to win, we exercise self-control in all things. And we're not running for something that is perishable. We're running for something that is imperishable. It is going to last throughout all eternity. He said, it's not an aimless race that we're running. I'm running to win. He said, I'm not shadow boxing, but I discipline my flesh to keep it under control. Think about athletes. They rise early, they train, they eat raw eggs, they avoid sugar, they get into the weight room. In our spiritual life, what do we do to make sure that we're yielding to the Holy Spirit? Maybe we wake up each day to spend time in silence and solitude before the Lord, eliminating the distractions of life. We eat the word to allow it to nourish our soul. We, we sit at the feet of our Savior, inviting the Spirit to take charge, asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, how do I need to order my life with self-control so that I can win this race? Never discount the importance of the Holy Spirit in your life. And here's what I want to encourage you as I wrap this message up today. You are never alone. God has seen fit to bring you into the race at this moment in history and everything that you need to live a godly, victorious life. If you said yes to Jesus, it is already inside of you because he has put his Holy Spirit inside of you. You can give forth the evidence of your faith. You can give forth the evidence that Jesus has saved you, that the Holy Spirit lives in you, and you have the hope that only Jesus can bring. But much like those kids that they did in the study, in two different parts of the world, they realized that kids were more able to exercise self-control when they knew that they had somebody with them, that they were not alone. You, ladies and gentlemen, are not alone because the Spirit of God dwells in you. And there's something even incredibly powerful about this idea of the race because not only is the spirit inside of you and you're not alone, heaven 
is watching. The writer of Hebrews tells us that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and because of this, they're cheering us on. They say, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You know what the beauty of that verse is? Where it says that Jesus had a joy that was set before him. You know what the joy that was set before him was? I believe it was you. I believe it was me. I believe it was all of his creation. And Jesus looked down the corridors of time and he saw us. He saw you in your struggle. He saw you in your pain. And he gave it all so that you could have life with God. And maybe you're watching this message today and you're thinking, you know what, that, that's the kind of life I want. That's the, that's the kind of life that I desire. I, I'm, just, I'm just lost and broken. I, I need the hope that Jesus can bring into my life. Did you know that he wants to place his spirit inside of you so that your life too can give forth this evidence of the change that only he can bring? And it all starts by you just simply saying yes to Jesus. There's an old gospel song, and I love the title of this song. It says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And that's, that's not something that's self-seeking or self-serving. It brings us hope. It brings us comfort to know that when Jesus was suffering his greatest pain, he had our pain in mind. And so today I want to encourage you to pray a very simple prayer in your heart with me. If you're ready to say yes to Jesus for the first time today, just invite him in by saying, Lord God, I come to you today and I thank you that you have provided a way for me to be in relationship with God. And so today I say yes to you. I ask you that you would come into my life, that you forgive my sins, that you would begin to lead my life, be, be the Lord of my life, place your Holy Spirit inside of me. All of my struggles, all of this, this that I have been dealing with in my life, I'm submitting these things to you and asking you today to let the hope that only you can bring to flood my heart. And I ask these things today in Jesus' name. And you know, what a beautiful prayer and what a beautiful promise that is. And for all of us who have said yes to Jesus, we know that if we want to live our best life that he's designed for us to give forth this evidence, we have to continually allow the Spirit to work inside of us to bring all of this fruit but specifically today to bring the self-control. And so as we close out our time together today, we're gonna to go into this song, it's called King of My Heart. And what I would love for you to do in these closing moments is I'd love for you to allow the truth of this song to sink deep into your spirit because you serve a good God who wants great things for your life. So allow this song to touch your life today and thanks so much for watching. May God bless you. King of 
of my heart Be the fire inside my veins The echo of my days Oh, he is my song Cause you are good You're good And oh, you are good You're good And oh Thank you so much for joining us online today. Make sure that you click the link below to see some of our I was, but now I am stories. These are people from our church sharing their raw stories about what they've been through and the journey that God has taken them on. We as the church have to lean into hard and broken areas of our world. And our hope is that these stories would encourage you and let you realize that you are not alone.